Okay, great. So, hello. Um, thanks for joining us at this webinar today. This is hopefully you've registered for it, so you know what to expect. But this is going to be talking about analysis for single molecule localization microscopy. So, my name is Sean. I'm going to take you through the first half, which is the basic process of how we go from our raw microscopy data to localized molecule positions in our data sets. So it's going to be a bit of a kind of whistle stop tour, but these are all the things that I'm going to hopefully cover during today's, um, during my part of this webinar. So we're just going to recap the basic principles of analysis in single molecule localization microscopy, SMLM. We're going to talk about how we might need to change analysis depending on what our raw data set looks like. Um, we're going to talk about how can you tell if the analysis is doing well or if it's going wrong, if there are artifacts, if there are errors. And we're going to talk a bit about how you can do loc localization in Z, so how you can get super resolution information in the axial direction. Um, some bits I might go a bit fast just so we can stick to time, but please do, as um, Bram said at the beginning, use the Q&A window. Um, we'll, all, we'll all be manning that and we'll try and get through as many of your questions as we can. Okay, so just a very brief recap of what is single molecule localization microscopy um, or SMLM. And I'm, when I'm saying single molecule localization microscopy, I'm using this term to cover all techniques like palm, storm, DNA paint. So all the analysis that we talk about today will be applicable to the kind of whole family of those methods. All right, so hopefully, as you know, if you take your fluorescently labeled um, sample to a microscope, just a confocal or wide field microscope, you can get a diffraction limited image, which might look something a bit like this. Now, this is a simulation. This is actually the Nubius logo simulated to see what it would look like under a fluorescence microscope, but it has the same basic properties. You have a resolution that's limited by diffraction to about 200 to 300 nanometers. So you have one image that's very, very complicated. It's got a lot of information in it. Okay, let's say we want to look at structures on a smaller length scale. We want to look at more detail than 200 to 300 nanometers. That's where single molecule localization microscopy comes in. We label our sample with a photo switchable or photo activatable fluorophore. And by doing that, instead of acquiring one single image that's got all of the fluorescent information contained with it, we instead acquire a very long time series with lots of frames where each frame has very simple information so we're spreading out our fluorophore emission over time to create a large um, series of very simple images. And if you just have a look at what individual frames might look like, here's a couple of examples here. So you should see, see in these individual frames, you can actually, with your kind of naked eye, see single molecule fluorescence events. And because in these kind of simple images, it's much easier to analyze this, we can then very accurately locate the centers of these molecules with subpixel accuracy. And the way we do this is with algorithms called detection and localization algorithms. So you can see we can convert each of our image frames into very high detail maps of where the molecules are. And then we, for every single frame in our data set, we localize every molecule within that frame very accurately. And what we can do is we can accumulate those localizations to make our super resolution image at the end. We can render our image and that typically has a resolution about 10 times higher than the original diffraction limit, typically a resolution of tens of nanometers. So today I'm not going to be talking really about anything on this top row. I'm not going to be talking about how to label a sample, how to acquire data, um, we're just going to be talking about the analysis. So we're going to be starting from the point of you have your raw blinking data set and you want to get the localizations out of that. If you, people that are kind of watching along, um, if you don't actually have any data of your own, don't worry, you can still do all the things that we're doing in the webinar. Um, all of the data sets that I'm using are freely available and you can download them from links that we've provided. So you can actually try this out yourself on data that's already available. Okay. So we're going to be focusing on this process down at the bottom here, detection and localization. So what do I mean when I say detection and localization? Let's imagine we've got a frame of data and we want to do this thing. We want to find the precisely the locations of each individual fluorescent molecule. The first thing we need to do, 
And this is actual real experimental data. This isn't a simulation now. The first thing you want to do is you want a kind of a rough estimate of what parts of the image look like a fluorescent molecule. And that's called detection. This is very much a kind of rough guess of which bits look like a molecule. And so the detection part of the algorithm will highlight areas roughly that look like a fluorescent blob, basically. Once we've kind of delineated these regions, once we've identified candidate fluorophore regions, the algorithm then moves on to the second part, which is localization, which is the very, very accurate localization at the center of each of those molecules. So if we kind of zoom in in one of these detected regions, it might look something like this. This is just one of those um, individual fluorescent molecules. The most common method for finding the center of this molecule very accurately is a two-dimensional Gaussian fit. Now, it's kind of difficult to show that on a slide, so what I'm just going to do just to illustrate this is plot out a one-dimensional fit to each of the x and y axes of this molecule. And you can see you can fit these, even though we haven't got many pixels, we can fit this very nicely with Gaussian functions. And we can use the parameter of these fits to find the real peak of this Gaussian, the real center, which corresponds to center location of that molecule. And so for every frame, what you get out is a list of molecular coordinates. And this is a really important point that I kind of want to make as clear as possible. In single molecule localization microscopy, you go from a set of frames, a set of raw images, to a list of molecule coordinates. You're not going from one image to another image, you're extracting a list of coordinates of every molecule. And this is a really rich source of information, which of course you can render as an image as well. So there are loads of different software packages that do this detection localization type analysis for you. I'm going to use one particular one as an example for the webinar today. Um, there are many, many ones available, but I'm just going to use one today called Thunderstorm. And again, don't let the name put you off. It's not just for storm data. It can use any single molecule localization data. So here's the reference for um, the paper that was accompanying the software release. Um, the paper itself hasn't got a ton of stuff, but what's really brilliant is the supplementary data of this paper. If you want to find out any of the maths of any of the things that the algorithm is doing, then dive into there. It's really, really good. And it's also got a lovely user manual. And kind of full disclosure, I am nothing to do with Thunderstorm. I just really like it. So some of the reasons I, I really recommend using Thunderstorm, especially if you're new to single molecule localization microscopy analysis, it's available as a Fiji plugin and it's all graphical user, face, user interface based. And this means that you don't have to worry about importing your data sets in any kind of complicated way. It's just how you would normally import data into Fiji. And you don't need to know how to script or code or anything in order to use it and do the analysis. It has the functionality to do both two-dimensional, three-dimensional localizations. And it has options for high density localizations. And don't worry what that means. I'll come on to that in the next slide that to say that it can handle all different types of data basically. The output which is this list of coordinates is really nice to manipulate in a GUI and really easy to export and also it generates protocol files that actually to keep a record of what parameters you use to do your data analysis which is really important for reproducibility and also when you're presenting your research and writing up your methods. So I said earlier that at the top of this slide that this is one of a great many um, different software packages that are out there. Um, Daniel, one of our moderators, um, and his team, oh, he's waving back, um, have published a couple of super resolution localization microscopy challenges, which is basically um, assessing the performance of all these different algorithms on some standardized data sets. Um, the most recent version of this challenge, Super Resolution Fight Club, um, don't talk about it. Uh, it's available at this reference here, and it's also linked in the resources. Um, the whole website for that um, paper and the associated challenge is really cool and really interesting for open source data, and also for seeing what other algorithms are available other than Thunderstorm. But as I said, today we're going to use Thunderstorm, and if you're interested on how to use it and how to get it, the, this is the easiest way. 
In Fiji, you go to the help menu, update, manage update sites. And Thunderstorm is available from the Holbein Lab update site. So if you tick the box left next to Holbein Lab, apologies if I butchered some pronunciation there, uh, add update site, restart Fiji, then it should be there when you open it. Okay, so that's the software that I'm going to be mainly working with today. So before I start analysing some data, what I'm just going to tell you about is something called data density. And this is something I alluded to briefly on the previous slide, but it's something that we kind of need to understand in order to know what analysis to do. And again, these data sets that I'm showing you are available from the Single Molecule Localization Microscopy Challenge website that I spoke about in the last slide, um, all downloadable with all the metadata, etc. So first type of data set we're going to look at as a low density data set, also known as sparse data. And low density data sets uh, look like this, and you can very clearly see individual fluorescent molecules turning on and off. You don't see many overlapping molecules, and there's a lot of space between your on molecules. So that's kind of one type of data we'll look at. The other type of data we'll look at is high density data. Now, as you can see in this type of data, you can see that there are still blinking events. You can still see that molecules are clearly turning on and off with their fluorescence, but there are many more fluorescent molecules present per frame. And you can see that they're definitely beginning to overlap a lot more. Again, we don't have time today to talk about how you get these different types of data, why they might occur, when it's beneficial, when it's not. All that to say, we're just going to talk about if you have low density data, this is what it looks like. High density data looks like this. And these are the different ways we need to approach the analysis. Okay, so now is when it's going to get fun because I'm going to be going to go rogue and enter and leave PowerPoint and enter a demonstration. So this is where anything can happen. Okay, and my face is currently covering my data. So I'm going to start off doing some low density data analysis. Here we go. So this is that low density data set. Uh, I've just dragged and dropped a TIFF file into Fiji. And if I scroll through, you can see indeed, it's got this low density blinking behavior. So I'm gonna talk you through how I would analyze this data set using Thunderstorm. This is exactly how I would analyze any of my own data. There are no tips and tricks that I'm gonna miss out or skim over. Um, I'm gonna try and be as complete as possible. So I'm going to my Fiji plugins menu. I've already installed Thunderstorm and I'm going to go to run analysis. And before I do anything else, just to make sure that I'm starting kind of afresh, I'm gonna click on default. It's gonna to revert to default settings. So this is the main analysis graphical user interface for Thunderstorm. And you can see it's broken up into several panels, which I'll quickly go through one by one. And even though I'm using Thunderstorm as my example software, any software you would use should have very similar features. So understanding basically what each of these things is doing should be directly translatable to a lot of other algorithms if you do want to use those. So first thing I want to do is tell the algorithm how what the properties of my camera were. Um, Thunderstorm in particular works in real physical units, so nanometers and um, photons rather than pixels and arbitrary intensity units. So hopefully if you've acquired data, you should know what your camera, pix camera pixel size was. It's 100 nanometers for this data set. And if you're using an EMC CD camera, you should also know if you had the gain on, EM gain on, and what gain you applied. These middle parameters are a bit more annoying. Um, these are related to the specific camera that you use to acquire the data. Now, these are properties that you should be able to find for your microscope, for your camera that you used. Um, so you can try asking your facility manager, asking who is in charge of your microscope or looking at the data sheets yourself. They do often go by different names and they can be a little tricky to find, which is quite annoying. Um, if there are any microscope companies or camera manufacturers watching and you specifically advertise your products for single molecule localization microscopy, I'd really kind of plead with you to make this kind of information front and center on data sheets for common algorithms that are used to analyze the data so it kind of can help out your users a bit more. 
if you don't know this, it's not the end of the world. It will slightly limit how we do the analysis, but I'll come on to that in a moment. So I'm just going to leave this as it is. Okay, the next step is image filtering. And this is basically smoothing our image and enhancing the bright parts to make detection easier, to make it easier to find the molecules. There are lots of options. You can explore them by using these nice friendly blue question mark buttons, which are really nice. Um, I'm going to leave this as the default, um, not because I'm being lazy, I promise, but because I've never had a reason to change it. Um, this filter has always worked with pretty much every data set I've ever analysed with Thunderstorm. The next panel is approximate localization of molecules. That's the detection phase. Again, I'm leaving that as a default for exactly the same reason, not because I'm being lazy, but because it's very robust and it does tend to work. So if you're kind of slightly skeptical of my default loving habits, what you can do is actually check how these two panels are performing by pressing the preview button at the bottom. What that'll give you is a preview of the currently selected, selected frame after it's been filtered in this image here. And it will also give you a preview of where it thinks molecules are, the detections. So these little red crosses appearing on this frame here. And it's doing a pretty nice job. So I'm confident in my faith in default parameters in this case. I'm just going to exit all of these things that have popped up. OK. So next panel is localization, so finding the center of the molecule from the, for each of those detections. Again, there are different methods. I'm going to stick with the default, which is like we we're talking about, fitting a two-dimensional Gaussian function. The only thing I am going to change in the whole of the defaults is the fitting method. Now, the default fitting method is something called maximum likelihood estimation. And this needs to know what the camera parameters are because it is based on photon statistics. It models the photon statistics in order to fit the point spread function successfully. If you don't know your camera parameters, this won't work properly, um, in which case you should use weighted least squares. OK, and that's what I'm going to use here. Weighted least squares is very slightly less accurate than maximum likelihood estimation. But in my opinion, the payoff in accuracy, it's very, very marginal. You're not going to lose tens of nanometers or even single nanometers, really, of accuracy from doing this. Um, weighted least squares is also quicker. If you do know your camera parameters and you've got, you, you're certain that those are right, please do use maximum likelihood estimation but weighted least squared is a bit more robust if you're not sure of your parameters. Okay, um, the fitting radius and the initial sigma, fitting radius is just telling you how far out the fit's gonna go from each detection center. So a little patch, that'll be seven by seven pixels. And this is just to initialize the fitter. And again, if you've Nyquist sampled your data, you shouldn't really need to change these from the defaults. This box, multi-emitter fitting analysis, I'm going to leave until later as a little bit of a mystery. Um, and then that's all the localization. So we're basically set up to run the analysis. Um, it's going to plot the localizations as it finds them into an image for us. And it's going to plot them on a five times upscaled grid, because remember, we're gaining resolution. So we're going to need to plot our localizations with a smaller pixel size. So our original pixel size is 100 nanometers. We're going to be plotting out our found detections on a five times upsampled image with 20 nanometer pixel sizes. And it's going to update our preview every 50 frames. So, fingers crossed, let's go. Okay, so you can see it's going through these 10,000 frames that I've got here and it's plotting out the localizations as it finds them. You can see again, we've got the larger image from the five times magnification, we've got 600 by 600 pixels. Whereas before we had 120 by 120 pixels. If you start off your thunderstorm analysis and you think, oh no, this is the wrong data set, why am I analyzing it? If you can press escape and that will actually quit the analysis partway through and just give you the results up to the point at which you stopped. So this is the awkward moment where I just wait for the last couple of hundred frames to finish off. Um, I'm not sure what to say in this period of time. 
other than this image is going to look really great by the time we are finished with it. So you're, you're in for a treat, I promise. This isn't awkward, not at all. We're nearly there, I promise. I'm not going to stop it prematurely because that will clearly do terrible things downstream and then we'll just get more of my terrible improvisation, which is something that I don't think any of us are physically or mentally prepared for in the middle of a virus pandemic. Okay, it's nearly done. Um, as this image is forming, you might also notice that some things look a bit suspicious with it. Don't worry, they're suspicious on purpose. Okay, just, it's, if anything, it's, it feels like it's getting slower, it feels like it's trolling me. In every rehearsal I've done of this, it's zoomed through at a rate of knots. We've got 100 frames left. This is excruciating and we're done. Okay, thank goodness that's over. We can all relax. So you can see that we've popped up with our particles table, which is um, basically a list of all the molecules that are within our data set that's found. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to nip back to the point PowerPoint presentation and show you what each of these columns means, because this is quite important for understanding our data. Okay, so here's our particles table. And what are the kind of really important columns here? So we've got our X, Y coordinates for every single molecule in the image. Each row is a different individual molecule that's been localized. And this is the center of that molecule. So this is the peak of that Gaussian fit. The next column is sigma, which is basically the, it's proportional to the width of the Gaussian that was fitted to that molecule. And so kind of can encapsulate, it's proportional to the area covered by your um, molecule. Next three columns are intensity offset and standard deviation background. And these are basically the um, intensity within that detection and within that detection region and the amplitude and offset of that. Chi-squared is just a goodness of fit measure that, to be honest, you don't need to worry too much about. But the last column is really important. The last column is uncertainty xy. And this is basically the error bar on your localization. So this is how confident you can be that the molecule is positioned where it says it is. A small uncertainty means you've got high confidence. A large uncertainty means you're less sure where the center is. Um, the uncertainty is calculated via this slightly clunky equation that's just appeared at the bottom. Kind of one of the important, and this is like lots of different parameters from this fitting is used to calculate the uncertainty. One of the kind of really important ones though is this N, which is on the bottom here. And N is the number of photons that were present during that blink event, during the, within that detection um, window. And so if you have a very high signal to noise ratio, if you've got lots of photons, then you'll have a smaller uncertainty and thus more confidence in your fitting. So that's kind of an interesting column to be aware of. Okay. So now that we know what our particles table is, let's have a bit more of a look at this window here. So you'll see that these, this is an image of microtubules and you'll see that something's gone a bit funny, right? There's, everything looks a bit fuzzy. And that's because I was a little bit sneaky. I downloaded a low density data set and then I synthetically applied some drift to show you what would happen if during acquisition, there'd been some microscope drift. Now, this is really common for low density data sets or any data set where you've got lots of frames. If we look in the tabs down here at the bottom of Thunderstorm, we have options for correcting that drift. Now, here we do, you can use, if you have fiducial markers, for example, fluorescent beads in your sample, we have one here, we can use this. But I'm going to show you how it works if you have no fiducial markers, because you can still correct the drift. And this is a process called cross-correlation. And what it does is it splits up your um, localizations into several chunks in time and then calculates how far you need to move them across each other in order them, for them to realign nicely. And it can then apply that afterwards. So just to be aware, there is a slight bug here. Um, I don't, I'm not a developer, I didn't develop the software, so I'm not sure where it comes from. Um, sometimes it objects to the number of bins that you put in. For example, the default here is five. I, if I press apply, I get this weird exception. Fear not, it can be fixed. Don't worry. Um, the way that I fix that is by increasing the number of bins, for example, to eight. I press apply. 
and he can see that it's estimated for a lot over time the amount of frame in, drift in x and y and it's basically rejig it's reshifted all the localizations based on that calibration curve and you can see that's got rid of all the kind of yucky drift in the image okay and you can see down the bottom here post-processing history drift correction tick so it keeps track of what you've done I'm not going to go over these tabs down here, the merging, remove duplicates and density filter, partly because there's um, not going to be enough time, but also because it's kind of an advanced level thunderstorming. Um, this is for things where, for example, you want to correct for the fact that a molecule has stayed on for several frames in a row and you want to collapse that back to one single localization. If you need to do that, then please, please, please read the manual and the supplementary information so you know exactly what's going on there. Because if you then want to do quantitative analysis down the line, which Florian will talk about, it's important that you know if you might have overcounting of molecules in your sample, for example. So there's nothing wrong with doing things down here, but you need to know what you're doing in order for it to make sense later down the line. I am going to talk about the filter though, because this can be really useful. So one very cool feature of Thunderstorm, and this is something that Bram introduced me to a couple of years ago, despite the fact I used it for years, I've never noticed this button before. Um, this is plot histogram. Histograms are fun. Um, and what this can do is actually show you the distribution of any of these columns in your data. Um, that sounds a bit weird. What do I mean by this? So let's say, we select uncertainty. What this will do is basically plot a histogram of the uncertainties of all of our localizations, which look a bit like this. So you'll see that the mean uncertainty in our localizations is about 12 nanometers, so that's quite a small error bar. That's good. But you can see that there are quite a few molecules that have large uncertainties, so that's where the fit maybe isn't as good and we're not as sure that those molecules have been localized correctly. If you have the square or rectangle tool selected in Fiji, what you can actually do is say, okay, let's say I want to build my final image or I only want to analyze these uncertainties, the ones that have got a kind of small uncertainty, you've got high confidence. You can draw this around here, click apply ROI to filter, and it's appeared in this text field down here. I can then press apply and it'll filter out those higher uncertainty detections. You can also type straight into this field. For example, if you had lots of kind of saturation in your first frames, you could then say, for example, ampersand frame greater than 10. So all the frames after frame 10. And it would then also combine that in the filtering. Okay, so we've got our beautiful image. We're really happy with it. We're ready to publish our nature paper. How do we export our data? First thing you need to export is the particles table itself. This is your raw data, as it were. So on Thunderstorm, we go to export and you can export it as a CSV file with all of the columns and always tick this button or protocol button. This is what will generate a text file that tells you what parameters you use for your analysis. So if I press OK here, hopefully on my desktop, I've got my CSV file and this file, and it says, you can see it's got all my camera settings that I applied originally. It tells me how I did my detection, my localization, and it also tells me what post-processing I've applied, applied, so what drift correction, what filtering. So that's really, really important. That's really important to save that anytime you do any kind of localization. Also, because you know, we're microscopists, if you like images, you'll want to visualize it, which you can do with this visualization tab down here. And this basically method here tells you how each localization is rendered onto this upsampled grid, which is five times magnified. Um, the two kind of best ones are normalized Gaussian and average shifted histograms. Um, normalized Gaussian will plot a tiny little Gaussian centered on each localization and the sigma of that Gaussian will be the uncertainty in the fit. Um, that's good, but it takes a bit of time. Um, the alternative is average shifted histograms, which does something very similar, but is computationally much faster. So I'm going to do that. And that's basically what's already there. Um, something that I personally am really guilty of, 
uh, apologies for the noise, my cat is scratching something. Um, if you, something I'm guilty of is applying jazzy lookup tables to my data. This is something we all do. We all like things to look fancy, right? Don't do it. And if you do do it, make sure you're really careful with your choice of lookup table. I know that grayscale looks boring, but it's perceptually uniform. You're not enhancing or suppressing regions of your um, image in a non-linear way. Uh, we've all been there. We've all said, oh, you know what would make this look really cool? Red hot. Um, this is not perceptually uniform. The bright bits look brighter, the dark bits look darker, even though we haven't changed the contrast of our image in a kind of brightness and contrast window. If you insist on using a lookup table, there are perceptually uniform ones available. I've linked some in the resources. This one here, for example, is a perceptually uniform version of Red Hot. So if you really want a jazzy lookup table, at least use a perceptually uniform jazzy lookup table. Okay, cool. So that's our low density data. So next up, let's do this again, high density data. So why can't we just, what happens if I just try and use this exact same analysis pathway to analyze some higher density data? Let me just let the cat out. I'm so sorry about this. Go away. That cat has been comatose for at least two hours and now she's like, high density data, I am out of here. Oh dear, okay, apologies. So here are two raw data sets, our low density and our high density data sets. And what I'm gonna do is show you how this looks along the different phases of reconstruction in the two cases. So if I analyze these two data sets in exactly the same way that I just showed you. So if we analyze our low density data set with thunderstorm in the way I just showed you, as we saw when I did the demo, the detections are pretty high fidelity. You get a nice one little cross in the middle of each little fluorescent blob, lovely. However, if you have a look at the detections for the higher density data set, you'll see they're starting to run into problems. For example, there are some molecules that have been missed and there are some molecules where there are lots of fluorescent molecules overlapping, where you've just got one detection in the middle of quite a big blob. And that's a bit, you know, suspicious. Okay, you might think, well, what's the worst that can happen? Let's go through and do the localizations and render the image. So this is what the rendered images look like for these two data sets. You can see our low density rendered image has quite a uniform um, intensity. You can see complete structures. You can see closely separated structures. However, our higher density data set has run into some problems. So you can see that some parts are quite bright, some parts are quite dim. And you can also see that the structures themselves have become slightly corrupted. For example, you can see there are some, it looks like some structures have merged together here. And it looks like some structures just haven't appeared properly in the image here. So that's one, those, those are two signs that your analysis has gone a bit wrong and that you're, you've got higher density data than your algorithm can deal with. Another way is to actually use that plot histogram function. So if you plot the widths, the sigmas of the fitted Gaussians for low density data, you'll see you get quite a narrow distribution. That's because all the Gaussians being fitted with about the point spread function of the microscope. However, if you do exactly the same thing for the high density data, you'll see you get this long tail. You're fitting some really big fat Gaussians. And that's where the algorithm has detected for example, the middle of a group of molecules and try to fit one big chunky Gaussian to all of those. So those are kind of little indicators that maybe some things are going a bit wry with your analysis, especially for higher density data. So how do we deal with this in Thunderstorm? Um, option number one is filter out bad detections, just chuck them out. So let's say we've got a region that looks like this. This would be a successful detection. There's one molecule there and it's got a nice thin Gaussian fit. However, Thunderstorm would also detect this as one single molecule, even though it's quite clearly more than one. Uh, the Gaussian fit here would be this big kind of fat Gaussian. And one thing we could do is we could just chuck the, those localizations in the bin and say, look, that's, that's not right. Let's just not include them in the final image. The other option is something called multi-emitter fitting. And so, this allows you, not what we just did, what I just showed you, was for each detected region, 
thunderstorm tries to fit one single Gaussian, one single two-dimensional Gaussian. Multi-emitter fitting allows you to try and fit several Gaussians to that one region, for example, a couple like this. So let's try that out. I'm going to close all these and we're going to open up our high density data set. Okay, so there, here we have it, high density data set. So all I'm going to do to begin with is go to Thunderstorm, run analysis. I'm not going to change anything at all. I'm going to analyze it in exactly the same way as we analyzed our low density data. Um, so you can see that the image is building up and this is what I just showed you in the slide and you can see immediately we've got real problems in this part of the image. We've got problems over here. Every time there's quite a few crossing structures, we're getting sad times. So let's see what option one would do. Let's just try and get rid of our fat, fun, fat Gaussians. So I'm going to clear this out. I'm going to plot histogram and I'm going to plot my sigmas. Okay. And so again, this is the histogram I just showed you. Let's say we only want to keep this half of the histogram. So we'll say these are probably where it fitted one Gaussian to one molecule. Let's see what happens to the image. I'm going to press apply. Okay, so it's cleaned it up quite a bit. You can now see that there are, there's less kind of fuzz in this part of the image, but you can also see we've lost quite a lot of information. And if we zoom in, we've got holes in these microtubules. So that's not ideal. Option two is the multi-emitter fitting. And this is something which is good, but computationally intensive. So what I'm gonna do to avoid any more awkward kind of waiting around for things to run, I'm just gonna duplicate a really small bit out of the image which corresponds to this area here. And the way I do multi-emitter fitting is the same as before, but just to tick this box here. And you can see it's now going to try and fit up to five Gaussians for each detection. So it's just starting now. And you can see this is already quite slow, even for a really small part of the image. It's running pretty slowly. Um, but we are actually getting better results. Um, we're beginning to see these three um, filaments appearing without having to filter out bad detections on the fly. So I'm just going to, whoa, loud, unnecessary. So I pressed escape there to stop the analysis. Apologies if I just deafened any, everyone with my kind of Windows angry noise. Um, I just pressed escape because otherwise that's going to take a really long time. But just to show you what the full results of multi-emitter fitting were compared to just normal. This here is, um, the same as the no density analysis with no filtering. This is then filtering out fat Gaussians and this is multi-emitter fitting. So if I switch between the two you can see what a difference it makes for high dense data to do multi-emitter fitting for example. Um, that's the last thing I'm going to show you in Thunderstorm. Um, before I leave Thunderstorm I just want to point out that um, our lovely moderator Bram and his colleague Rolf have gone to a lot of effort to make some really nice, and especially a lot of effort to get it ready for today, some macros and plugins that allow you to batch processing with Thunderstorm. Again, this is linked to in the resources, but it's some really useful tools. And now hopefully, you, you know, if you, you feel confident in knowing how to use Thunderstorm and you can race through all your data sets efficiently and confidently with these tools. Okay, so high density data in general is quite a problem. And spoiler alert, Thunderstorm isn't actually that great at dealing with it. So this is a plot from um, the single molecule localization microscopy challenge. Um, these are different algorithms run on one of the benchmarking high density data sets. And you can see that Thunderstorm, poor old Thunderstorm is quite near the bottom here. It's not particularly great at high density data in general. If you have high density data, you might want to try and go towards another algorithm. Um, a word of caution, I tried to download at least five of these completely unsuccessfully and couldn't install them and get them running. Um, lots of these are very brilliant, but the user-friendly level is quite a little bit further down. 
of the better performing ones, Peak Fit is available in Fiji. And again, if you go to the Single Molecule Localization Challenge website, you'll get download links to all of these algorithms should you wish to try them. And PSMLM, which is Phase SMLM, is actually available within Thunderstorm in the drop down localization methods um, part of the GUI. Um, I haven't demonstrated it because it's not something I've personally used regularly in the past, but if you're going to be doing a lot of high density analysis, then I strongly suggest maybe reading through the paper and giving that a go. Other options for high density data sets are actually pre-processing the data. So one new method which is really promising for this is Hawk, which is the wavelet filtering method. And it was published a couple of years ago in Nature Methods um, from Richard Marsh and Susan Cox over at King's College London. And it's available as a Fiji plugin. Hooray, we love Fiji plugins. And basically what this does is you give it a high density data set and Hawk makes it look more like a sparse data set. So for example, your original data set has frames that look like this. You run it through Hawk, you get frames that look like this, and then you can run a lower density algorithm on top of that. And what's quite nice about Hawk is that if it goes wrong, it goes wrong in such a way that it collapses to a low resolution version of the image rather than a fake structures or weird artificial sharpening. If it fails, as Susan says in her talks, it fails noisily, you know if it goes wrong. Um, very briefly, another option if you've got very high density data, and this is more going towards fluid force that don't really blink at all, there are non-particles table approaches that convert your data stack straight into an image. These are things like Sophie and Surf. Uh, full disclosure, I'm one of the authors on Surf. Um, this is how SURF performs on that high density data set. Uh, again, Fiji plugin. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that here, or any detail actually, but just so you're aware, if you don't need a particles table, if you don't need to know the locations of each of your molecules, and you've got very high density data, you might want to give one of these a shot. Okay, so we've talked a lot about how to reconstruct our images. How do you know if you've done a bad reconstruction? How do you know if your image is very sad and should be thrown straight in the bin? Um, single molecule localization analysis can produce some weird results. Um, this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are some examples. So firstly, closely separated structures can collapse into one structure, it's called merging or artificial sharpening. So here's an example here. I simulated these kind of hairpin structures uh, at high density and ran this through thunderstorm and you can see oh quite a nice result but what's happening as these two kind of parts of the hairpin are converging they're actually collapsing into one bit instead of saying two separate entities so you start to lose this separation before you'd expect this is happening it is not just limited by the resolution the uncertainty of the localizations it's actually an artifact where Instead of picking out two, it's detecting one in the middle. So that's bad. You can also lose bits of your structures. So for example, this is the low density data set. And I did some filtering to get rid of bad detections around a fiducial marker. And you can see I've got holes in microtube fields. So that's not good. And also you can get intensity non-linearities. So for example, even though these structures are meant to have uniform um, intensity, you can see that these parts look much brighter than these parts. So these are some artifacts that you can get in your images. Um, I was kind of worried about these. And so over the last couple of years or so, I've been working on an algorithm called Squirrel. And this is a method for assessing the quality of super resolution data, not just single molecule localization data. Um, the reference is down here. And essentially, the again, not gonna have time to go into this in detail, but what it does is you provide a reference image, which is a high quality wide field or kind of focal image of the same region of interest that you've imaged in super resolution. And you basically use that as a gold standard for your super resolution reconstruction. You compare the two and bits where the images don't match up. Those are probably due to errors in your super resolution procedure. It's available as download uh, via the Fiji update sites, the same as Thunderstorm. Uh, you need to check both the NanoJ core and the NanoJ squirrel boxes. 
Um, I found that there are a couple of, it uses the GPU. Some graphics cards get really, really angry and crash Fiji if it's not compatible. So what I'm actually going to be demoing on is this little mini release, which is GPU independent scroll. And again, this feels safer um, on my laptop during a webinar than trying to make the GPU doing something mad. So a very quick demonstration of Squirrel. So what I'm going to show you is Squirrel running on these two reconstructions. So we might ask the question, OK, I've got a data set. I've reconstructed it twice with slightly different parameters. Which image is better and where is the image better? So I've got my super resolution reconstructions and I've also got my reference image. In this case, this is just an average of the raw data frames for this data set to make a kind of quasi wide field image. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to plugins, squirrel no GPU, calculate error map. And all you need to do is just provide links to these two images. So my reference image is this one. My super resolution reconstructions are these. Press OK. And there we go. It's always a relief when your own software works in a live demo. So what you get out of Squirrel are images like this. So you get a quality metric. So this is the RSP. This is basically similar to the Pearson's correlation coefficient where a value close to one indicates a better image. So this is saying that the second image in our, of our two super resolution images is a higher quality than the first one. And that makes sense. You can kind of see that visually. Poorer quality, better quality. The other thing you can get with scroll is an error map, which highlights areas in your super resolution image, which might be, for want of a better word, dodgy. Um, in both cases, you can see that there's this very bright region here that's being highlighted. And if I go back, you can see actually, yeah, there's something weird happening in this part of the image. Uh, very much so here, slightly less so here, but something untoward has happened in the localization process. That's Squirrel has loads more capabilities like mapping resolution, etc. Um, I don't have time to go through it, as I said, but please do have a look at the paper um, and the documentation if you're interested in using Squirrel because it'd be really nice to kind of validate your reconstructions. Okay, very finally, what happens if you're trying to localize in 3D, in three dimensions? Um, basically, you can't really get axial localizations unless your microscope has specific optics to encode additional information into the point spread function. What do I mean by this? Well, normally your point spread function is symmetrical above and below the focal plane, which makes it really difficult for an algorithm to tell whether a localization that's out of focus is out of focus above or out of focus below. If you use a microscope that has a cylindrical lens or two cameras that's slightly defocused or a phase mask that puts in a double helix point spread function, you can encode the Z position into the point spread function of your microscope. So for example, with astigmatism, the degree of ellipticity, so that ovalness, changes with the defocus with Z. Um, and you need to have calibration data for your own microscope. And calibration data is normally, for example, an image stack of beads at different Z intervals. And lots of different algorithms can do this. Um, again, from Daniel's paper, comparing them all, I'm going to very quickly show you Thunderstorm running on astigmatism data, so with the cylindrical lens, um, because this is pretty much what you'll need to do for any 3D data, you'll first need to calibrate and then apply that to your localizations. So what we have here is this is a simulated data set of some microtubules and it's simulated as if it were imaged with a cylindrical lens. So you've got some elliptical point spread functions. And this is real data of a Z stack of beads imaged with that same cylindrical lens. First thing you need to do is actually make sure that Thunderstorm knows how to associate the shape of the point spread function, i.e. how elliptical it is, with where it is in Z. So again, you have the camera set up. It's all very similar to what it looks like in our standard Thunderstorm analysis. 
apart from this time we're going to fit an elliptical Gaussian function, so one that allows for an extension. And I'm also telling it that in this calibration data, images are every 10 nanometers plus or minus 750 nanometers from the focal plane. And I'm going to tell it to save a calibration file so that I can use that later to the desktop. So I'm just going to call that Astig calibration. Press OK. And so this is with this image selected, my calibration beads data set. Um, that should be running through. Lovely. A bit more awkward waiting. Even more awkward waiting. The suspense is killing me as well, don't worry. Um, so this is doing a fit to each of these beads and working out what fit parameters are associated with what position in Z. So then whenever it finds a point spread function of that same shape in the real data, it can work out from the shape of the point spread function where it is in Z. So you get a kind of slightly manic looking calibration curve. Um, and I've got my calibration file saved here. So to apply that to my data, I now have my data set selected. I'm going to go to Thunderstorm, run analysis. And what I'm going to change is I'm now going to say elliptical Gaussian 3D astigmatism. Uh, I'm not going to do multi filter analysis because that will break my computer and this feed. And I'm going to point it to the calibration file that I just made. Um, it's 3D. And so I'm going to tell it to do this. And what I'm getting now is for different Z locations, it's binning the localizations according to Z. So these are localizations that were within the range five, minus 500 to minus 400 nanometers, and then 100 nanometers up, 100 nanometers up. And you can change this binning however you want in Thunderstorm. And now our particles table has a column for the Z location and also for the uncertainty in Z. Um, and then this is basically every 100 nanometers, it split the localizations up according to their Z position. Um, again, you can display that as a montage in your paper, et cetera, um, in Z. And you can also, for example, go to Hypestax temporal color code and make a kind of merged image where it's color coded by the position in Z. Okay, so in terms of 3D analysis advice, I don't have much more. Um, much like my personality, my kind, I'm kind of limited to 2D in my experience. Um, one which performs really well across the board for 3D analysis is SMAP. And this is one that I managed to successfully install, which is good news. So it's an installable piece of software. Um, here's the graphical user interface. It's MATLAB based, but you don't need to download MATLAB. It also runs as a standalone. Um, an interesting kind of side note in this is that um, if you have calibration data for a, a microscope that hasn't got additional optics for 3D, you can still extract 3D information just from um, a standard microscope. I'm not going to go into that now, but I think that will be something really interesting in the future. This can act, the fitting in this is so good, it can actually work out asymmetries in the point spread function, even if you don't have, for example, a cylindrical lens. That's pretty much all I've got, apart from some very general advice. Um, get familiar with one piece of software and test it on small amounts of data first. Make sure you know what the parameters are doing. Make sure you understand what's going on. And really importantly, if you're putting this in a paper, in a report, in a thesis, however you're presenting your data, write up what you did really carefully. Um, what algorithm did you use? Cite that algorithm, tell, say what version you used of it, what parameters did you use, how did you render your images, did you apply any filtering, et cetera, et cetera. You really can't put too much detail in this part. Um, and it's just really good practice. And I think it's something that is quite underreported. Um, that's all I've got in my section. Um, I forgot to put a timer on, so I have no idea quite how horrifically I ran over time. So I don't know if there's time for some verbal Q&A now or not. Um, Ram. I've got a few questions. Uh -oh. One question, two questions actually, are um, talking about low density and high density data. So is there, is there a cutoff? Where's the cutoff between low and high density? 
And is there a problem at some point to use the multi-emitter fitter in, that, in those data sets? In other words, is there a downside of using the multi-emitter fitter besides the time that it takes because it's much slower? Right? Yeah. So, so okay. So with regards to high and low density, it's really not a clear cutoff. Um, you can't, you know, I can't look at a data set and say, that's a high density data set or that's a low density data set. In reality, um, unfortunately, your data sets will often probably contain some regions which are high density, some regions which are low density, you often even get a mixture within the same image. Um, my advice with analyzing, unless it's very clearly very overlapping, always start with the low density analysis and then go through some of the tests which we looked at, looking at the distribution of the sigmas, looking at how well the detections are performing to see how wrong you really are going. And then as if you're seeing some benefits to using the multi fitting, then try that. There will be a point when multi emitter fitting stops working. For example, if we think about your limit of you can't just feed um, a time series of solid GFP data into thunderstorm, say, do multi emitter fitting and expect it to work. It just won't. Um, again, the cutoff is really difficult to put a number on. There's no magic formula for density, unfortunately. Um, there are some papers, um, for example, the SURF paper, which I referenced in the non-particles table method um, section, in that we show some different density data sets and what happens with different algorithms. Um, that, that can get, if you have a quick look in the supplementary of that, that'll give you a bit of an idea of the kind of densities where, for example, multi-emitter fitting really begins to struggle, but it's not really something that you can say, oh, this data set definitely won't work, this data set definitely will. It's always a kind of continuum, unfortunately. The denser you get, the more you're going to have to really try with our other techniques outside of multi-emitter fitting. Hawk, I really recommend. And then as it gets really dense, things like Sophie and Surf. All right, thanks. Another question, another two questions actually about Squirrel. Can you use or can you or misuse maybe uh, the plugin Squirrel for comparing white field images and deconvolved images and or can you use it for globalization analysis? So I've never tried to kind of hijack Squirrel for co-localization analysis before so I'm going to just say no to that one. Um, I'd not like to speculate how to do that. But in general, Squirrel will work for any method where you have one high confidence but lower resolution image and one processed or uncertain image but that's at a higher resolution. That's the kind of two assumption it, assumptions, assumptions it makes. So for example, we've used it on SIM images, etc. So there's no reason it shouldn't work on deconvolved data. Um, you could should be able to use deconvolved data as your super resolution and non-deconvolved as your reference. Um, but kind of the key thing to remember with Squirrel is any artifacts that are or errors that are already in your reference image will be also perpetuated into that final error map. So for example, it gets dangerous if you use a deconvolved image as your reference image for then looking at, for example, localization microscopy data. Um, the best way to use Squirrel really is with, for example, a high quality wide field or a confocal image as your reference and then you're processed as the super resolution. Um, otherwise you start accumulating errors from all sorts of unknown sources when you start, if for example, you were to put a deconvolved image as your reference. All right, thanks. Um, so the last question maybe um, is so also people are wondering about multicolor imaging and chromatic aberrations. Can you say something about that? Yes. Um, so I've, again, my experience is pretty limited to single color imaging, but I know that you have um, macros that are available for chromatic aberration uh, um, correction on thunderstorm and analyzed particles tables, if I'm correct. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> so um, if you go to the, the alec lab.github.io, uh, yeah, there's 
plugins that can take care of that. But it's not so easy actually to do the chromatic aberration correction. I mean, it's, it's doable for sure, yes. Cool, but yeah, again, I don't really have anything to add to that. Um, I'm not a massive expert in multicolor um, imaging. Um, one of the ways where you can actually avoid it altogether is by using techniques such as DNA paint or exchange paint, where you can, instead of using different colors, use different labeling methods to avoid things like chromatic aberration. Yeah, exactly. But in terms of the actual analytics, um, again, the plugins that you've provided are probably as good as I know for this type of problem. Well, I hope so. <laughs> um, I think that is about it with the questions. Thanks, Jan, very much for your fantastic uh, webinar. And we immediately go over to Florian. Okay, so um, we'll go directly on my part. So I'm Florian Levé. I'm a researcher in the Cyberitas team at the Interdisciplinary Institute for Neuroscience in Bordeaux. And uh, here I will speak about the quantification of the localization that uh, Shan show you how to localize, in fact. Uh, in my part, I will do mostly um, a presentation of the technique and explanation of how they work. And then at the end, I will do some demo on the software that I'm developing, that is SRT Seller uh, and Colloct Seller, but I will not speak of colocalization on this webinar. Uh, you can find uh, SRT Seller here. Uh, you have a one-click installer for Windows, and uh, the data sets and slides are available here, and then you have the speaker and moderator team of today. So, uh, we have localization. Here you can see uh, diffracted limited images of a fibroblast expressing integrin, but now that we have the localization, we can, we want to find the organization of the design site where we didn't see anything when we have the diffraction limited images. And here we have the localization and we want to be able to quantify the organization. And how can we do that? At first, uh, people get back at the beginning of the technique in 26, people get back to what they knew that were images. Uh, so here you can see the diffracted Im limited image and the zoom here on uh, three to three pixel. Here the pixel size is 160 nanometer. So now you have the localization and here you can see uh, the same region with the localization. And how can you create a super, uh, super uh, reconstruct super resolution image? What you will do is just say that, okay, maybe now I want a pixel size of 20 nanometer. So now the pixels are a lot smaller. And what you are going to do is you are going to project all the pixel, all the localization inside the new pixel. So you get this kind of image. Uh, so it's quite sparse. Here you can see, for instance, that you have a hole here. And what people do when they want to use a reconstructed super resolution image, as shown show, is that they are going to apply, for instance, the localization uncertainty of each of the localization in order to have something that is smoother and easier to segment. The problem is that obviously, uh, with very different uh, biological model, we will have very different organization of the localization of the, of the protein, of the molecules. And then uh, it's very difficult to normalize to every kind of uh, biological model. First, uh, the pixel size that you define will affect the quantification because if you have a pixel size of 20 nanometer or 40 nanometer, obviously you will not have exactly the same image. Uh, the pixel size is fixed. So that means that you're oversampling sparse regions and under sampling denser one where you will have maybe a thousand of localization inside one pixel. And usually when you are using uh, intensity based uh, quantification, you need to combine different techniques and then it's complex to reproduce and generalize to every kind of biological models. But now, and even what a bigger thing is that you have localization. You have coordinates of your localization. So why going back to a discrete space that is an image? And how can we use this localization? But even with the localization, there is quite some uh, difficulties that are the experimental parameters uh, that comes from the fuel for photovisics, the labeling density, or even the acquisition time. For instance, here you can see four different uh, neurons. And so it's a effect in protein that was labeled uh, on neuron. And 
Here we have just normalized the density of the image with respect to the number of localization of this data set. And here you can see that these data sets are five times more localization than this one. And we want to be able to segment that exactly in the same way. We don't want that the user come back and change some thresholding, for instance, in order to do a segmentation that is specific to each of his uh, uh, data set. We want something that is more automatic uh, in order to avoid user bias. So now I'm going to speak of the two main set of techniques that are developed for quantification of the localization that are clustering and segmentation. So when you are doing clustering method, you want to try to statistically characterize small aggregates of molecules, usually by comparison with a random distribution of the molecule. So that means that you are really doing statistics and want to find these small aggregates. In segmentation, what you are going to do is that you are going to classify the molecule in different classes with respect to some defined attributes, some density, for instance. So we can see clustering we can see clustering as one application of the segmentation because when, with segmentation, you can segment clusters, but still it's different because clustering is really statistics and segmentation is not. Uh, the most used uh, clustering technique in the field is the carry play function. Uh, so it describes the average number of molecules that exist near another molecule within different radius air. So that means basically that you are computing the density around each molecule at different radius r, and you try to compute the deviation from a spatially random distribution. This is computed iteratively for various uh, radius. So this is the equation. It's in the end very easy. That just means that you compute the number of uh, molecules that are inside your radius r. You divide by the average density of the data set and you sum for all of your localization and divide by the number of localization. That means that you are doing some normalization, uh, that you are very robust to the density of your data set. When you are using carry play function, you know that if you have a random distribution, the number of localization that you expect in radius r will be pr square. Basically, it's dependent of the, of the area of your circle. Uh, but the problem is that it's difficult to understand when you just plot the carry play function. So people use the hash replay function that is just a normalization of the carry play function. And in this normalization, you know that for a normal distribution, your function will be zero. So you see it's just carry play divided by P on a, on a square root and you, uh, remove, uh, you subtract the radius. So if we go on a few examples, here you can see a cluster distribution here, and here it is a, a complete random uh, distribution. We are going to some magnification of the cluster. For each of the localization, so here we have only three examples for each of the, of the data set, but we will do that exactly the same way for all of the localization. You have your radius, you compute the edge value, so the, number, the density around your localization divided by the area of the circle, basically and you will have different values. So in this case, it's cluster. So we have a bigger value than the one that is random. We get another radius that is bigger. We compute again the value for the two distribution. And in the end, what you will see is that if you have a random distribution, your value will be very close to zero. And if you have a cluster distribution, you will have this kind of, of curve. And here, the maximum will be the radius of maximum aggregation of your, of your data set and then the radius of the cluster that you have. So that can be very interesting when you have different conditions and you are really interested in knowing which one is the more clustered. And you can see here that some people have used that, Trin AL use that in order to do, uh, to compute, uh, to analyze the RST2 clustering with different conditions. And when you see the different curve, you can see that here, for instance, in this case, you have the higher uh, value for the, for the curve. So that means that there are the bigger cluster. And even the shape of the, of the curve gives you some indication about the density of the cluster and this kind of stuff. Here, I can uh, go back to the fibroblast data set that I show. And here we have some cluster in the background. And here we have an adhesion site that you can see here. If we go to the replay function, we easily find some cluster in this case because we have background and clusters, but in this case, we don't see anything because there is different level of organization in your data. There is background, clusters, 
and the adhesion site. And when you have this kind of, of stuff, it begins to be difficult for the replay function to find what is a cluster, and this is expected. So very good point. It is normalized, so you really don't care about the, the density of your data set. It gives you only one value, which is the radius of the cluster. So if you're interested in having more information like uh, size of individual clusters on this kind of stuff, you cannot have this information with this uh, technique. And then it's sensitive to multiple value of organization, but it's something that is expected because you only want to find some clusters. Another very close uh, technique for clustering is a pair correlation. Uh, which is uh, expected to protect against overestimation of clustering that, came, okay, that come from multi-blinking of your offer. And because you will not compute the density inside circle, like for carry play, the overcounting that comes from this kind of multi-blinking doesn't, doesn't propagate to higher length scale. So if you have the carry play and you do the pair correlation, at the beginning it's the same, but then at the second level, here you can see that you are doing ring. So you don't count all this localization in this ring. You do that again and again and again. And in the end, you have this kind of, of, uh, of curve. And if you have something that is random, you will have a curve that is around one. They even managed to derive uh, the, the, mathematica, the mathematics of uh, the pair correlation in order to find from the experimental curve, the cluster radius, the molecule per cluster and the cluster density. Another very interesting uh, couple of techniques that were developed by the lab of uh, Dylan and Wen. First, that's the Bayesian clustering. So in this case, you have a model-based clustering, meaning that you have a pure distribution that is supplied by the user, like the distribution of radius uh, that you would expect on your data. The posterior will be the probably, probability of any given assignment of localization to cluster, basically the cluster proposal. And what you will do is that you will have two parameters, radius r, because for each of the localizations they are using the hash replay function in order to have a value for each of the localizations that will be thresholded with some kind of threshold. If the value is below the threshold, it's background. If it's higher, it's a cluster. And then you will go through the whole space of parameters. So you will change the radius and the threshold and get this kind of, of uh, value. Here you have a line that says that if you are below, you are dispersed, and if you are above, you are clustered. And then the Bayesian model will find the proposal that is best fits the model that uh, was given at the, at the beginning. And they use that, that, for instance, for finding clustering of, of this kind of, of cells. They also did the, this year, some machine learning, so that's a very trendy uh, technique now, machine learning, deep learning on, on biology, and they use a neural network. But what is interesting in the, in the technique is that usually neural network uh, are using images. So now we have coordinates, so you cannot, there is a few, uh, a couple of techniques that can take points, but not most of the technique of the neural network take points. Uh, so they wanted to go back to image, but not just the image at the beginning. And what they did is they used the nearest neighbor. So for instance, you take the 100 nearest neighbor of each of your point, and then you will compute the difference of distance between the consecutive neighbors. So we will get this uh, distribution for this point that is clustered, and this is distribution for this point that is uh, not clustered, just uh, a random distribution. And when you do that for all of your localization that are here, you'll have this kind of result where you can really see that there is a difference in the distance when it is clustered. And then you feed that to the neural network. And the, the neural network will really be very good at uh, identifying that these points are clustered and then you can get your cluster. So now I'm, uh, I have talked about a few of the clustering methods that are used in the field. I will go on segmentation technique and certainly the most used in the, in the, in the domain is DBSCAN, density-based spatial clustering analysis with noise. So segmentation technique, you can segment object or cluster as you wish. The, the way the technique works is that it organizes the localization with respect to three classes core point, density reachable point, and outlier points. And I will explain how you find them just after. And it uses two parameters, a radius uh, that is a neighborhood size that is used in order to compute some density, and a mean points that is a mean number of points in air 
for localization to borrow core points. So the min point is different at the min number of points for a cluster. So if we go, you, know, you can have this kind of example. So it's pretty nice. And if you are having a small example here where the min points is four, you go to this point here, you can see that you have five points in the radius R. So this is a core point. If you go to this point, there is only two points, but one is a core point. So we call it a density reachable point. And in this case, we have only one point. It is outlier point. You do that for all of your points. You end up with this classification. And usually in a single molecule localization microscopy analysis, we are using both core point and density reachable points as point for clustering. Uh, some people have used that in order to count protein in bacteria and uh, find a really nice number uh, with that. And again, if we are going to the data that I just show on the, on the fibroblast, here I have just put two values, a radius of 35 nanometer and mean points of 15. And the density here is 400 molecules per uh, micron square. You can find this nice segmentation. But then if you do that on the adhesion site where the density is a lot higher, then you begin to just get Every, look, every cluster of the adhesion site as one object. So obviously you can change the parameter in order to find the cluster in the adhesion site, but now you are losing some of the, of the cluster in the background. So in the end, uh, uh, it's very nice, but you have two parameters and uh, finding the fine tuning two parameters is always difficult and it's not normalized. Uh, so that's real values that you are giving, hard value, and then if you have very different density in your data set, you will need to change your parameter and that's quite a problem. Uh, another widely used techniques are tessellation based techniques. And the first one that was used in single molecule was Delaunay triangulation. So it's a subdividing space technique that uses triangles constructed for molecule coordinates. So from this, that this uh, data set, this localization, you end up with this kind of triangles. And by construction, you know that no triangles would overlap with any other triangles. And what they used first was a global definition of a cut distance. So if uh, a distance, the cut distance is 25 nanometers, that means that if a triangle has an edge that is bigger than that, it is not used in order to reconstruct the cluster. And then you end up with this kind of result. But again, as for db scan, it is a hard value. So if you have uh, more denser data sets, you will end up with uh, merging everything. And besides, uh, if you want to use uh, the, the, the structure in order to add relevant information to your data, to your localization, it's difficult because the triangle is connecting three localization. And so we decided to use the dual of the Delaunay triangulation, which is a Voronoi diagram, in order to uh, try to quantify the localization. And the dual means that you can construct one from the other. If you have the Delaunay triangulation, you can uh, see that uh, the, for the Voronoi diagram, you are creating polygon around the localization and that this edge of the polygon are basically the bisectories of the uh, edge of the triangle. So it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the idea. And in the end, any point inside the polygon is closer to this localization than to any other of the localization that you can see here. So again, Voronoi diagram is a space subdividing technique. It's an isotropic by nature. And then it's very interesting because you have a bijective representation for one localization, you have one polygon. Two features that are very interesting with Voronoi diagram is the connectivity. So you directly know the direct neighbors by construction and then the scalability because the denser the polygon are, the smaller the denser the localization are, the smaller the polygon will be. So what we did is try to use that in order to find some way to add relevant information to the localization and to compute same density. And so for, if you have this localization, uh, we can, uh, if we uh, call it the rank one, the number is one, just the localization. The area is the area of the polygon in yellow and the density will be one divided by the area of the polygon. But then you can go to the rank one because of the connectivity. So we can now say that the number is five this localization plus, plus the direct neighbor. The area is the addition of the yellow and green uh, polygon and the density is five divided by this whole area. And then you can do that for the rank two and again and again. Uh, 
but in the end, we mostly used the rank one, and we found that it was interesting because it kind of smooths a little uh, the value for the density that can be really, really interesting when you are doing some uh, segmentation. And here you can see that we have just uh, colored every polygon with respect to its density. So what is interesting with the Bornoi is that you can do some kind of a normalization. So it's not a mathematical normalization, but still it's normalized uh, the density in order to be able to use it exactly the same way when you have uh, similar organization, but very different uh, localization density. So for instance, here you have some cluster. In this case, it's exactly the same cluster. You can see that here we have five times more localization. So obviously if we compute the Voronoi density, the Voronoi diagram and we compute the density and we plot the distribution of area, the distribution of density as a logarithmic distribution, we will have some shifted distribution. That means that if you are just going to the distribution and try to put a threshold here in order to segment this cluster here, we will end up with this threshold here and then we will pretty much take everything in the background. But what is very nice with the Voronoi diagram is that you can very easily normalize that by just dividing the density by the average density of the data set. In this case, you end up with this distribution for the two data set, and then you can very easily apply exactly the same threshold to the two data set and have a nice segmentation of the cluster. Uh, so even if it's a segmentation technique, some people have used that in order to do some clustering by comparing the average distribution uh, to Monte Carlo simulation. So the idea is that you have your experimental data, which has, which have n localization, and you will do a number, a defined number of uh, simulation, for instance, 500, with a random distribution with the same number of localization and the same area. You compute the Voronoi diagram, and you plot the polygon area, and then you will see that this one has a lot of small polygon area, obviously, because it's clustered, and this one has al always quite the same distribution. In the end, you can compare the two distribution, put a threshold, and really segment beautifully, completely automatically, the cluster. But still, it will be long because you need to do some simulation. And then if you want to segment this kind of microtubule, then you are screwed because, well, it's not cluster, and you cannot just say, uh, find it with respect uh, to, 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 statistically, find it with respect to the background. And so what we propose to compare the local density to the average density the, uh, of the data set and just threshold. So if you have these two, uh, these two data, again, same, the isolated uh, cluster and the adhesion site, we compute the Voronoi diagram, we compute the local density, we apply one time the average density, and we end up with this segmentation. You will say, okay, it's exactly like for DBSCAN. You just have the adhesion site directly segmented here, and, uh, and you don't have the isolated cluster inside. But now we can exactly apply the same technique that I show inside the object. We know the average density inside the object, so we can say we will keep only the, re the localization that I have one times more than the average density in the adhesion site. And in the end, we will end up with this uh, segmentation where we have segmented the cluster in the adhesion site, but we still have the segmentation in the background. And it's very easy because we have only one a parameter and the idea is that when you have done that with your data, you just fix your threshold and do that for every one of your data uh, that you have to apply, to analyze, sorry. No, so now you have object. How can you compute the size and the number of localization of this object? So for the size, we have basically three ways to compute the size. Either you are using the outline of the polygon and you compute the area or you can compute a bounding ellipse. Uh, so the smallest ellipse that contain every localization, but usually you overestimate the object side with this kind of, of way of computing. And then you have the principal component analysis. So what you are going to do is that you are going to do a regression uh, of your localization of your cluster in order to find the main axes uh, that describe this cluster. You find the orthogonal axis that is at the centroid, and then you will project every localization on the two axes. That will give you a distribution of distance in the first axis and the second. You compute the standard deviation of this distribution, and then you multiply by, you multiply by 2.35 in order to have, to, to have something that is similar to the full width at half maximum of Gaussian fitting. 
And in the end, I would say that used area or used PCI, depending on what people in your domain are using. If they are using area in order to describe the object that they are analyzing, use the area. But if they are using Gaussian fit, for instance, use PCI. In the end, you can end up with this kind of nice segmentation of all the uh, clusters in the in the data set and find some uh, some uh, quantification of the size and the density inside the cluster. There are a few uh, methods that allow us to do 3D segmentation. Uh, in particular, there are, there are the 3D Voronoi diagrams that were done by Andronov and Al a couple of years ago. Problem is that they are using two tools. So for quantification, they are using MATLAB. And then for visualization, you need to use Python. So it's not very integrated and it's very time consuming. They are reporting six hours to uh, analyze a data set of 800,000 localization, which is very, very common in uh, single molecule localization microscopy. They also report on a DB scan implement on a 3D DB scan implementation in VividStorm. Uh, this paper here, but it's even worse because they report eight hours for 67 localization, 60, 67,000 localization. There is also a, a 3D version of the Bayesian analysis, which is in R and is packaged as script. So I never use that, but I expect that it's difficult to do everything inside, like visualizing your, uh, your result, uh, for instance, and show what you have. And I expect it also to be quite time consuming because already in 2D it's very time consuming. And then now we have done all this technique in order to do some segmentation clustering. And we can say, okay, it's perfect. We have very good number, but all these techniques are expecting, let's say, perfect data set. Uh, what we know with uh, single molecule localization microscopy is that you have experimental parameters that will affect what you get. Uh, for instance, if you are using fusion protein, like in PALM, you would expect a ratio on one and one, like you would have one fluorophore for one protein. And then if you manage to identify the protein, you will get all your protein in your data set. But it's in fact not really the case. If you activate one protein, it will happen like that. It bleach, you activate the second and third, fourth, five, six. But in the end, you don't have just one peak. It's blinking. So that means that uh, you need to take that into account before doing some stoichiometry analysis, for instance. And uh, overcounting and fast clustering can be um, can be resolved either by first you need to have low level of activation in order to really be able to separate temporarily all the peaks, and then you will need to use some dedicated analysis program to regroup all the blinking of uh, the the protein inside one. And basically, what it does is that it will uh, run analysis on all the on all the fluorophore on your data set, like trying to find uh, the distribution of dark time and on time, on time and off time, and then it will fit some distribution and find an average dark time for your for your fluorophore, and then try to do the temporal uh, the temporal grouping. And even for antibodies like in Storm, you can have the same kind of problem. But it's different because before you were bleaching your protein, so you knew that when you are here, this fourth protein that has bleached won't come back after. So you can do this temporal grouping. But in the case of, of antibodies, it's not the case. Basically, you, uh, your, your, your fluorophore will go on, blink, go off, and can go off for hundreds or thousands of frames before coming back. So you cannot just say, okay, this is one. Uh, protein. This is another. This is another, because this is only one protein here, and so in the end, if you have several one, you end up with this kind of stuff, and then again, you have this problem of of clustering that is not real cluster but just one uh, protein. And one of the solutions that is used is that to do ratiometric quantification. So I will just go back on that on the next slides. And also, you have the problem of the labeling density, and when you are using antibodies. Uh, usually you have the secondary antibodies that has the fluorophore, so the first primary antibody, the second one will stick to the first, and then you can have several second on uh, the primary, so it's very difficult, and one solution is to really try to have short linkers and direct labeling, uh, 
uh, in order to don't have this kind of, of problem. So about the ratio-metric quantification, uh, here for instance, this is uh, some uh, data of a neuron where we were interested in Ampar nanodomain, so you can see them in, uh, in uh, purple here. But then we have this Ampar nanodomain and we wanted to know how many Ampar receptors there is inside. But how can we just first among them and find this information? Because this is storm, so we just get on and on with the fluorophore. So first we need to find what is one isolated Ampar receptor. But then how many fluorophores there is on one isolated Ampar receptor? So how many localization for one uh, Ampar receptor? And how can we separate these two populations? So what we did is first we try to find some internal control on the data. And this is here, all this uh, small thing here that are isolated uh, fluorophore in the background are our internal control. So we sing on them, we find the size of the structure, so we can do the distribution of size of the, of the object in the background of the isolated fluorophore. We uh, fit a Gaussian, we found an experimental resolution for our experiment of 33 nanometers. And then we also have the blinking, blinking statistics, so basically the number of localization of each of the object. We plot this distribution and we find that the median is 22 localization per isolated fluorophore. So now we are going to segment everything that is inside this RV, inside the, the neuron. And we have this distribution that is isolated and on par nanodomains. So how can we just separate the two? What we know is that uh, on par receptors are a complex that are full protein, so something like 10 nanometers. Uh, nanobodies, antibodies are 10 nanometers also, so we have something that is around 30 nanometer here and here around 20 nanometer, with an experimental resolution of 33 nanometer. Basically, they are exactly the same thing, the same size in your in your data. So that means that we took this distribution, define the five to 95 percent, so between eight and 59 nanometer, and we said that isolated on par receptor at this size. So now we are able to separate these two populations. We found the number of localization of this isolated Ampar receptor, and we can uh, weight it with respect to the, to the number of localization of isolated fluorophore. So we found that each of the Ampar receptor has a, has a median of 2.72 fluorophore. And then in the end, we have the distribution of all our Ampar nanodomain, and we can find the distribution of size and we can plot the number of uh, Ampar receptor inside uh, the Ampar nanodomain, Ampar nanodomain. And that's the way how you do some ratio-metric quantification. And in the end, some experimental way to some very promising technique in order to do stoichiometry is to use Q-paint, where you are using then DNA paint. So you have uh, a Docker strand, a DNA Docker strand on your antibody here. In the solution, you will have some uh, imager strand, and when they bind to the Docker strand, the dye goes on, and when they unbind, the dye goes off. So that means that what is very interesting with that is that your blinking is not uh, dependent from the dye photophysics, but is dependent from a predictive binding kinetics of the strand. And if you have a complex with several proteins, you will have a different uh, frequency for binding. And basically, your dark time will be smaller because you have more protein here. In the end, what you are going to do is that you are doing the cumulative distribution of all the mean dark time, of all the dark time that you get, and you find the mean dark time. And you can see here that for this one, the mean dark time is smaller than for the one that is alone here. And when you have uh, you will be able to compute the number of binding sites after calibration. And I'm going here on a specific thing that is very interesting, I think, for really showing that it's very important to understand what you are doing when you want to interpret uh, your data. This is something that is coming from the Solar Lab. And in 2009, they used this storm in order to uh, study the real receptor. And they find at this time, with a resolution of 30, nan 30 nanometer, that they thought that this receptor 
was organized as a regular lattice from of 30 nanometer per 30 nanometer, like this way. But in 2014, some uh, study challenged this assumption and they used electron tomography. So they get back to single molecule localization microscopy uh, two years ago, but with the advance of technology. So they used uh, DNA paint. Uh, and in this case, they managed to have a resolution of five nanometer, much better resolution because of the DNA paint. And they use Q paint, like I just say, in order to find the proper number inside uh, the different uh, cluster. So here you can really see that you see puncta that are the individual ray receptor. They are doing the cumulative distribution to find the average dark time. Then they are using some internal control here to find the weight of the dark time and to find the real number of the ray receptor inside the cluster. And in the end, they find that what they thought was the organization of the re receptor was not really that. And the re receptor is more like organized this way with some gaps and cluster. And even the, they performed some colocalization with another protein and show that it was quite different than what they expected. So it's very important to pay really caution to what you are doing and to really try to have best resolution and, and really understand what you are doing. So I want obviously to find my team and my boss, Jean-Baptiste. The source code for the tesseler is here. You have a window installer. You can, if you have some problem, raise an issue on the GitHub, and then you can also go on the forum im.image.ec with the tag tesseler if you have some question. And so now I'm going to do some very uh, fast uh, demo of tesseler. So you have the GitHub here. As I said, you have some results release here where you can download this installer. I have already done that. So here you have how Tesseler is looking. Uh, you can open CSV that are generated by uh, Thunderstorm with it. So here I just open with the data set that I showed before. What is interesting, I think, with uh, Tesseler is that we don't use images in order to do the display. We really have a vectorial display. So you have the localization and you can really see the localization. Here, you have a MISC quantification where you have the replay function, uh, implementation of the replay function and dbscan. And for instance, in this case, I show you the car replay. As I said, it's very difficult to understand. And here it is the hash function. Even if I put L here, it's the hash function. And you can see that we have a radius of maximum aggregation of 100 nanometer in this case. You can also try uh, DB scan with this tab. And here you will directly do some uh, segmentation of the data. And then you can change the radius, which I call distance, the mean number of localization in order to find what is a core point. And here you have also mean number of localization in the cluster in order to say, okay, this is a cluster. Then here you have the tab for the Voronoi diagram. You can create the polygon. And then you have this density map. And then you can just, okay, say, I want something like maybe one or two as a factor of the density and then you can create some object in order to have uh, your data. So this is uh, the version of Tesseler. You have also a detection cleaner here in order to clear, in the case of PAM, PALM, in order to do some temporal grouping. Uh, and now I will do a fast demo of what is coming with Tesseler, which is still not public because my source code is a mess and I need to really clean it before making it available. But basically, it's going 3D with Voronoi diagram. So for instance, here, you can see that you have a few localization. I will do some construction of the Voronoi diagram. So here, what you can see is that what takes time is to create the cells, the Voronoi cells, in fact, it takes a long, a very long time. So it's not something that is uh, obligatory in, uh, in, the, in the software, in the algorithm. But then if you do that, you can see your different cells. And then you can obviously do some segmentation. 
like that. And then if you segment your object and don't show the Voronoi and show the object, you end up with this kind of result. For instance, you can very easily go on one object in order to see how it is, for instance. But I, I have done quite some work in order to make it fast, I would say. And then if I go here, I will open this data. So it takes some time because there is 1,600,000 localization. So it's quite a nice data of mitochondria. So it will arrive. It's creating the, the viewer and this kind of stuff. I will close that. Up that it doesn't crash this error. So you have this kind of result. I will create the one diagram. So I will, it will take some time, but uh, even for 1,600,000 localization, it won't take hours. In the end, it will take less than a minute. At least it should take less than a minute in order to do the Voronoi diagram. And the idea is that first it's create a Delaunay triangulation, 3D Delaunay triangulation, and then use that in order to do the Voronoi. And uh, part of the Voronoi is done on the GPU. Uh, so that's why it's very fast. There is this portion now that is something that is just rearranging the data in order to feed it to the GPU that I would love to scale down as a time because it's a bottleneck that annoys me, but for now it's like that. And then construction of the Voronoi cell is done already. So very fast on the GPU. And if you go here, now we will show, we, we, have, we have the, the density of our data set that is computed, and then you can do some segmentation I uh, should have put a mean number of localization bigger than that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's still okay. And then you can really go on some part and see what you have and then do another segmentation inside of your object in order to have some, uh, some uh, cluster, for instance. So that's what's coming, taking a little longer than expected because I don't have time right now and I really need to, to do some uh, cleaning of the code, but at some point it will be released and, and available to everyone. And it's the end of my talk. Wow, that was super impressive. Let's go over some questions. There are not so many, but we have a few. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, do the clustering techniques shown, in particular the Voronoi, work with non-circular shapes? So the segmentation technique will work with non-circular shape, for sure. For the clustering, like carry play and this kind of stuff, it's uh, working less, for sure, because of the way that the radius is computed that is having a circle, basically. So it's working well with, uh, with circular shape and less with elongated shape or this kind of stuff. That's not really true, it seems, for the machine learning thing, as they tested it on elongation, or elongated uh, data, and they managed to still do very nice uh, clustering. Cool. Uh, so another question um, is, what happens to the localizations that are spatially located near to a cluster, but have a large polygon area? Would they be counted as part of the cluster? or not part of the cluster? So that's usually uh, with Voronoi, usually they won't take be part of the cluster. Okay. So obviously it depends on the still on the threshold that we will use, but uh, usually their density is a lot bigger if there is a real, uh, uh, not a lot of background for instance, uh, the density will be a lot bigger, but you won't take it, yes, usually. Yeah. Okay, so we have some questions that are already answered in the Q&A window. Um, the last question is, uh, when will this become available? Yeah, well, ideas on that? Yeah, I hope in a couple of months, but I won't. 
I won't say that for sure because uh, one of the things that I've done, I have done with the first version of Tesla is make it very robust. So from my understanding is that I don't have people saying that uh, it's not working, it's crashing, except for reading some file, but that's just a problem of either in the file. And right now I'm not at this level with, uh, with this version and I really want to try to make it the most robust possible. Uh, when it get uh, released. So I would say, I hope that uh, in a few months, maybe summer or something like that, I will have a first version, uh, but I will wait really to have something quite robust. All right. Um, so, so maybe the very last question that just came in is uh, related uh, because people want to know uh, what kind of hardware you need to run this 3D segmentation on SR Tesla. So for what I show, you will need a NVIDIA card. This is a CUDA, uh, CUDA code. So this is really uh, linked to NVIDIA card. But then I would expect it that with a normal card, it should work. For instance, it don't work on my laptop, but it's because it's an Intel HD uh, crap card. Uh, processor, I would say, not even card. But uh, if you have an NVIDIA card, and I would say any NVIDIA card, it should work. Okay, that's good to know. Maybe not if it's 15 years old, but something five years or something like that. Yes, sure. Okay, I, I think uh, that was it then. So, um, yeah, normally I would say let's thank all the speakers, <laughs> Jean and Florian. Florian. So everybody's applauding now. And thank you for your participation. Thanks also, of course, Daniel and Pedro for helping moderating this. And the Q&A session will be completed and it will be posted on the image.sc website on the new bears part. So with that, I think uh, we should end.